the next session we have up is about copyright. And I know that can be quite a scary topic. Um, and that we all want to be on the right side of as well with all the legality that comes with it. But what are the exceptions to copyright that you can actually use to undertake digital activities for your heritage organisation? Well, here to tell us is Naomi Korn from Naomi Korn Associates. Naomi, are you with us? I am indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. Good after Chris. Good afternoon, Chris. I am. I'm raring to go. Um, I've been listening in on the sessions you had before. Fantastic sessions. I feel really proud to be able to contribute to a broader sectorial discussion about digital strategies. And I've got some really exciting things to share with you. Lovely, lovely. Well, this is what I'm particularly interested in. It's not something I can I can see I'm incredibly knowledgeable about. So I'm going to pop my listening hat on and, uh, and leave it to you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. So are you happy for me to grab the screen from you? Go for it. Yeah, we'll see you back here for the Q&A. Lovely. Thank you. Good to go. Love it. Thank you so much. Right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking for about 35 minutes about the exceptions to copyright. Um, I'm Naomi Korn. I'm the Managing Director of Naomi Korn Associates, and we are a very proud partner in the Heritage Digital Project. We work with absolutely fantastic partners here, have been doing for a number of months now. And um, this is part of our contribution, looking at a lot of legal compliance issues. So I'm going to be talking actually about two dimensions here. I'm going to be talking about how you can use the exceptions to copyright to support digital activities. So that's great. I think that's what you're expecting. But there's another side to this, which is that I'm also going to be talking about how you can save money by using the exceptions to copyright in order to free up money to take forward your digital strategy. Because actually, and I think we as a sector haven't spoken about this enough, if we understand better the copyright exceptions, it can actually contribute more to our long-term sustainability as a sector. And I can hopefully sort of feel your ears pricking up right now. So I'm gonna take you through um, a very brief overview of copyright, kind of what it means and why the exceptions to copyright are important. And then I'm gonna be looking at some case studies. So we've actually pulled out some real life examples of how some of our colleagues across the UK heritage sector have used exceptions to copyright successfully. Now I'll also um, give you a heads up right now that over the next couple of weeks, we're writing a guide about this issue. So just like all the other guides that we've produced, like the guide to copyright and suppliers, there'll be one on copyright exceptions that you can take away and you can read up everything you ever wanted to know. So you'll be kitted up to hopefully use these fantastic kind of carve outs in the copyright law to support your activities better. Okay, so um, just if you haven't come across us before, we've been around for 18 years this June. Um, we being quite literally, we a fantastic team at Nermicorn Associates, Patrick Ibbotson and also Maddie Beeson. We also have about 20 of the top consultants in the country now forming part of the Nermicorn Associates team. It is my absolute pleasure to head up the team. We do a lot for the sector, have always done, have always supported the sector. And I would strongly recommend that you jump on the Heritage Digital website after today and see some of the gems that we've created as part of this project. And also if you jump on our website as well, you can find some other things you can download for free. Okay, so just to remind you about what we're going to be covering today. And as I said, I'll be talking now for about 30 minutes. Um, importantly, there'll be time for a short Q&A after this session, and then you can jump into a breakout room with me and we can really kind of get down to some of the issues that affect you and look at copyright exceptions within the context of your work. So I want to refresh you first about copyright. So there's so much I could tell you, but I want to boil it down into some key big principles. Now, the way that copyright arises is that when somebody, anyone creates an original work, i.e. something that no one else has done before. And when we're talking about work, something that you can see or hear or touch, something that is broadly defined as creative. Now, this is the law defining this, not me. When we talk about a creative work, what we mean are things like writing a letter or taking a photograph or creating an artwork. Um, any of those types of kind of creative works that we are oh so familiar with in our collections, as soon as that is made, copyright protection is automatic. It does not require registration, unlike some of the other intellectual property rights to which copyright is a family member. Now, 
because copyright's automatic, it means that the person generally who created that new, unique, creative work gets a reward. And the reward is a copyright. It means that they have the rights, the exclusive rights to copy that work. That means reproduce it, put it online, adapt it, perform it, share it. And if anyone else wants to do those things with that work, they have to go back to the original creator and ask for permission. Now, the slight kind of deviation on that key principle is that if you're an employee, anything you do for your employer, anything for on behalf of your employer, the copyright is owned by your employer. OK, so let's just put that to one side. And of course, this also raises all sorts of issues about contractors and volunteers and suppliers. But you can find out more about that in our copyright and suppliers guide, which you can download from the Heritage Digital website. OK, so we've dealt with that. Now, what this means is that heritage organisations like you guys will find yourselves in several different roles simultaneously. You will be users of other people's copyright works, okay, you might want to put these works on your collections online, you may want to use them in exhibitions or publications, but also you will own your own copyright. That might be photographs you've taken of items in your collections, that might be text that you've written in marketing information, so you'll be, if you like, both kind of both poachers and gamekeepers. And this is important when we look at the exceptions in more detail. But what I want to do right now is set the frame and already establish the principle that we will have squillions of works in our collections, but actually we don't automatically have the rights to be able to, re to reproduce these works. And it looks a bit like this. So we will have collection items. So that might be postcards that might be photographs that someone took a hundred years ago and capturing a moment in time that might be a letter that one person wrote to another it might be perhaps something like an artwork or a painting or a drawing as i explained we will also have loans so items that perhaps we've secured either the short-term loan to use as part of an exhibition program or maybe even a long-term loan and some of you depending upon if you are a heritage organization like a an archive for example will have deposits so people have kind of asked you to be the custodians of these works and it might be sort of unlimited but you don't actually own them okay so lots of different contexts here we will also have items in our collections where people may have been asked to commission them on our behalf so i'm kind of thinking about art commissions okay so we've had a particular idea we want a creator to create something bespoke to us we're also using as part of our marketing activities our exhibition activities lots of content that doesn't really form part of our collections, but might add value to our activities. That might be content we have found on the internet that we wish to use, and we either use it under a license that's already there, like a Creative Commons license, or that we actively go out and seek permission to use it. That might be um, content, for example, from the Bridgman Art Library, from Getty, from Alame. And that's not all. We will also have works um, that are created by students, perhaps, or volunteers who, part, who form part of our heritage family, interns. OK, so there's a massive amount of a multiplicity of different types of copyright protected works that we will have some, some kind of touch point with. OK, so that is the list that you have the primary list um, on the right, you have here a kind of a list of how we might traditionally think about using these works. How might we reproduce them if we don't own the rights? So some of you, um, particularly those who are accredited as part of your accreditation procedures, as part of um, being compliant with Spectrum, um, you may well have policies in place whereby you try and acquire rights to an item when you acquire it into your collection. And that's all fine and good if you're acquiring the work from the person who created it, but if you're getting it from someone else, maybe purchasing it through auction or another place, you can't always do that. And of course, this policy is very much a policy in the last, say, 10 to 20 years. You'll have a retrospective mountain of items in your collections where you haven't tr uh, tried to clear the rights upon acquisition and um, where in order to use them fully, um, you need to think about seeking permission. OK, now then there are other mechanisms for this way of operating in terms of getting the permissions you need. Um, it might be that you secure permission um, when you are borrowing a work. Um, you may have particular arrangements with your volunteers. Um, you may be going out and getting permission on a case by case basis. And then some of you and probably the majority of you may even not have any choice because you may have works in your collections which are defined as orphan works which are works in copyright where the rights holders are either unknown or cannot be traced. And there, the sort of options are 
at the moment, do not use, think about the Orphan Works licensing scheme issued by UK government, or potentially thinking about a risk managed approach. So that's some of the ways that we might, as a sector, deal with the problem of either being the owners or custodians or borrowers of works for which we don't have the copyright, we don't have permission. But there is another way. And this is really fundamental to our sustainability, as I said, as a sector, because hot wired into the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988, that's our foremost piece of legislation that determines how copyright is dealt with, um, is what's called um, or referred to as the exceptions to copyright. And these are very much the balances between on the one hand, the exclusive rights that rights holders have to control how their work is used to make money from reproducing their work, but at the same time recognizing that there are certain public interest activities, such as those that support education and learning and heritage activities for which special carve outs in the law are required. And these are the exceptions to copyright. Now, what the exceptions to copyright are, are defenses. They are very specific types of purposes of copying that we can use copyright works for that are deemed to be a part of this bigger balancing act, complicated balancing act that the legal compliance framework tries to achieve between on the one hand sort of freedom and access and on the other hand control and privacy. Now it's not the same as some of you may have heard fair use, which is, for example, what the US has. We have um, copyright exceptions which are caveated as needing to be fair dealing, i.e. fair to the rights holders. Now, it means that when we think about or we contemplate using the exceptions to copyright to support our digital strategy, we need to be aware about OK, well, what might be fair? What might be a fair amount of a work to use that would fall within the exception to copyright? Fair also, I guess, means that in a way we need to think about if we were that person whose work we want to use, what would we deem to be fair? Another term that's used is reasonable or justifiable. And I would say that because of the sort of lack of a definitive yes you can or no you can't in that we have to give a judgment call sometimes about using the exceptions to copyright and I will give you examples about how that plays out. Also because copyright has traditionally filled people with fear and, and Chris thank you very much for your kind of introduction I think that was absolutely perfect because it does intrinsically feel that like it's an obstruction I think we forget that there are enabling aspects to the copyright legislation and as a result, the copyright exceptions, in my opinion, are probably the most misunderstood and underused aspects of copyright law, particularly for heritage organisations. And this is why this webinar and the accompanying guides are so very important to understand in order to support your digital strategy moving forward. So this is the first opportunity for a poll. Um, I wanted to find out um, if my belief is true. And the question I have in the poll, which um, I'm hoping can be activated in a moment is, how do you regard um, the use of the exceptions to copyright? A lot, sometimes, infrequently, or never? Okay, so I'm just going to give a moment for the poll to be launched. If you would like to kind of give your view and then I will um, let you know what the general feel was or feel is in the room. Do you, how often do you use the exceptions to copyright? Now, I suspect that if you don't really understand them, you probably never use them and that's fine and we'll take that into account. So if, if you'd like to complete your poll, give you another 10 or 15 seconds to complete it and then we'll look at what you said and then we'll start unpicking them for you. Okay, right, so the results. Okay, this is very telling. So we've had 10% of you who said that you use them a lot. 19% of you say that you use the exceptions to copyright sometimes, 26% infrequently, and 45% never. So if we take the bottom two, the infrequently and never together, that makes uh, roughly 70, or it does make 71% of you either don't use them or infrequently use them. And I'm really hoping this is a result of 
this webinar and the guide that we're going to make available to you really, really soon, that you will consider them and there will be opportunities for you to use them all. So thank you all so much for um, taking part in the poll. So let's look at um, what they are. So again, um, I said that I believe that copyright exceptions are very misunderstood and misused across our sector. And I think also this is in part as well because of the legacy of the 1988 Copyright Designs and Patents Act, which have sort of framed in them some exceptions to copyright, which for many years never really suited our purposes, didn't, hadn't really caught up with what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in a heritage organization, didn't, for example, cover um, digital use of our collection items, didn't cover um, preservation activities that support the sustainability of our collection items. And so they've been largely seen as being of little benefit to our sector. But this changed in 2014. And I would say that the changes that came through in 20, the year 2014, the enhancements, to our copyright exception regime are still only just filtering through. I, I think that there perhaps are many people who haven't looked since um, perhaps the 90s at the legislation and what it says to understand that in the last six, seven years, we've had a considerably better framework that supports our activities across the heritage sector in ways that are more realistic. Now, I was really proud to be um, one of the um, sectorial leaders in bringing these new exceptions to copyright home, working with the minister and with civil servants. And I'm really proud about what we've had. Um, there's always a dilemma here that our activities are moving forward quick, more quickly than the law is changing. However, what we have, I'm going to take you through them one by one, are perhaps so much better then I'm hoping some of you has envisaged and will encourage you to review whether these can support your activities more. Okay, so the first one I want to take you through, the first exception to copyright is the non-commercial research and private uh, study exception. Now this facilitates the use of copyright works to support your sort of own personal use. Um, the emphasis has always been on the purpose of the copying rather than the nature of the organisation. So it would be feasible for a commercial organisation to use this exception in very specific contexts that are not directly or indirectly related to money making activities. Um, crucially, and this was a result of lobbying activities recently, this applies to all the different types of works protected by copyright, which includes sound recordings and films, broadcasts and artistic works and literary works. Okay, so the full plethora of works. Now, an example I have for you um, is of a visitor to a historic castle um, who's able to take photographs of items within the property and to use these photographs to support their own non-commercial research and private study purposes, which could include their creation of a scrapbook or as part of their research into a family tree, as long as there is no commercial exploitation. Okay, so for some of you, this may be worth looking at, perhaps for research activities associated with your heritage organisation. So again, to be clear, the exceptions to copyright do not require permission. Okay, they are defences, so you really need to make sure that you understand how you can use them. And there is an outside chance, outside chance that they could be challenged if you go beyond the extent of the exception. Um, but they do not require permission at the same time, which is why I started this presentation um, about the importance of understanding exceptions to copyright within sort of saving money and long term sectorial um, sustainability. OK, our next exception to copyright is the criticism, review and quotation exception. Now, this was very much remodelled following the 2014 changes to the UK legislation. Um, previously, quotation was not included, but this was a, a fundamental change because it enabled um, the use of extracts of copyright works. And if you really look at this, to support some very specific heritage activities. Now, I've given you examples here, which include using um, excerpts of sound recordings within exhibition spaces or reprodu the reproduction of images of arts in corporate plans. But I wanted to give you a very kind of um, exact case study, which has been provided by the VNA. So um, for their 2019 exhibition, Video Games, Design, Play and Disrupt, the VNA were not able to secure clearances for some of the imagery that they wanted to use um, on the screens within the exhibition. Um, they felt that um, 
the criticism, review and quotation exception would enable them to use certain extracts of works in this way and could be suitably defended as being reasonable and justifiable. So they pursued that line. Now, what they did was they um, reviewed how the exhibition was structured and felt that they could, on the basis of the parameters of the exhibition and their particular context of use, that they could use extracts of YouTube footage of games being played within the context of the criticism, review and quotation defense. They did this because the exact use of those extracts supported narrative that was provided on the exhibition panels. And in addition to that, and this is a requirement of the exhibition um, of the um, exception to copyright, the um, exhibition interpretation panels provided not just the context, i.e. the narrative, but clear attribution to the source, supporting the use under the exception. So that's a really solid example of the use of the criticism, review and quotation exception to support your digital strategy within an exhibition space. The third exception I wanted to share with you that will have um, an importance within the role of heritage organisations is the current news reporting exception. Now, this is mainly used by press and marketing teams and it uh, permits the reproduction of certain works within newsworthy contexts. And like all the other exceptions, it means that if you were to use exception to copyright, you would not only have to review how reasonable it would be, review the context of your use, but also make sure that you suitably credited the source and any rights holders. For this particular example, um, I'd like to thank the National Portrait Gallery for enabling us to share this with you. So they regularly use this exception to promote the unveiling of newly acquired paintings. And this means that um, they feel justifiable in using a copy of the painting to be used in press and marketing materials associated with the acquisition and unveiling of the original work. Um, they also feel very strongly that this exception could be used by press photographers to include their photographs of displayed items in reviews of new exhibitions and displays. So again, another neat example from our sector to show how other organisations have optimised the benefit of the exceptions to copyright framework. Moving on. And this is why the guide is going to be really good. So you can refresh your knowledge and get these case studies in print in front of you um, under a reuse license, a CC, Creative Commons Attribution license. So the text and data mining exception. Um, this is brand new. OK, this came in in 2014. The UK at that point was only one of three countries in the world that had something like this. Um, the EU will be implementing um, a very similar framework from the spring of this year. So uh, European countries will also have something very very similar to this but we were pretty pioneering in the UK with this. The text and data mining exception is really fit for the 21st century for the digital age because it enables um, the analysis of vast amounts of copyright works using algorithms and computational analysis which is really important to have as a tool during the digital deluge. So an example I can give you um, to add to um, the sort of outline that you have there is of a conservationist working for an environmental organisation using this particular exception to research, to carry out research into threatened species. And this is of huge value, as I said, when there are lots and lots of different types of copyright works that need to be analysed, whether they are um, internet articles or whether they are print based journals or they are even the items themselves I do know this exception um, being used to analyze vast amounts of film footage to find patterns or images so it's an important one for us in our research and into furthering analysis of our collections and understanding connections between different collection items Moving on, the illustration for instruction purposes. You see there's loads here, and I think this is what's really exciting. We haven't done enough analysis of what these exceptions mean. So the illustration for instruction purposes has been part of our legislative framework, um, but it was only in the year 2014 that it became relevant to us as heritage organizations, because for the first time, it enabled us to use an exception to copyright to support our educative activities, our classroom activities, 
possibly even our virtual learning activities, not web-based activities, but virtual learning activities that might be taking place during COVID. So I've given you an outline here of um, use in a facilitated classroom teaching environment. It could be um, showing excerpts of films or images to, to um, students to support the curriculum. Um, it could also be um, other in-house training. So maybe um, some of you might have um, training at the same time on the dreaded GDPR or UK GDPR. Um, and that would enable you for in-house training to use images of copyright works to support the learning experience. In 2014, we also saw uh, the brand new exception of parody, caricature and pastiche. So fair dealing for the purposes of parody, caricature and pastiche. And I remember talking to government about the importance of giving the heritage sector this exception to copyright because often um, we may struggle with items that we are either borrowing or form part of our collections that themselves are parodies or are caricatures or pastiches of other copyright works and until we have this exception to copyright we carried liability for reproducing these items or even displaying the real items and I remember when I was working at Tate and back in 2000 and the Turner shortlisted candidates were announced we had a work by the artist Glenn Brown that itself was a, a kind of parody of another work and having this exception now in our legislative framework um, sort of rolled back, if you like, when I was at Tate at 2000 would have helped the Tate and helped us enormously because it provided, if you like, a shield for our activities because of the existence of this exception. So another one to bear in mind, another one to digest at this point and to read up more about following the webinar and the production of the guide. New in 2014 as well. Um, but, and this is a particular relevance to cultural heritage organizations was the dedicated terminal exception. And this is a, a lovely one for framing the exceptions to copyright within the context of supporting your digital strategy. Now, admittedly, this particular exception to copyright is very much about on-site visits, okay? It doesn't support online activities. This is about when people come into your premises. However, it has huge value. Now, what this exception is, is a means for heritage organizations who have works in their collections um, to provide them with the um, sort of enabling feature of being able to put images of those items on dedicated terminals for walk-in users to access. Now, what that means is um, that could be something like a diary that you might have in your collection that's too fragile to touch. You could create a digital copy of your um, diary and then have a turn the page type of functionality a bit like the British Library has or Tate has in order for visitors to be able to see each part of that item. Now it kind of has a twofold purpose. On the one hand, it's about ensuring that our very delicate items aren't touched and we still can enable access. Um, but also it takes into account, um, I think, the kind of realistic situation that we're all in, which is that we have more items than we have space to display. So the dedicated terminal exception enables us to create a digital version through the preservation exception, which I'm gonna to come to in a moment, and then display those digital versions on screens. I think dedicated terminals is perhaps a bit of a rabbit warren. Um, this was uh, from wording that goes all the way back to 1999. So I think the dedicated terminal has room to be reinterpreted by us and could include, for example, um, a historic monument issuing uh, visitors with a tablet preloaded with information relating to the monument, including architectural plans and historic photographs. Okay, so that really juicy material that we have in our collections um, that provides some real context, whether it's to our buildings or our spaces or our items that we just don't have the place to display. Now watch this, play, this space with this exception to copyright. I will be doing a lot more explanation in the guide, but I can see real benefit for some of our on-site activities. And I alluded to this as well um, just now, which is the preservation or replacement exception. Up to 2014, not massively useful for us because it was very kind of work type oriented, didn't cover all the works in our collections. Um, but this really has been opened up since 2014 amendments to the law and now enables us to make copies, digital copies. So again, about supporting your digital strategy of all the items in our collections, okay, for the purposes of preservation. 
this is absolutely fundamental. And I remember um, when I was preparing some information for the minister to present to the House of Lords about the importance of these exceptions to copyright being changed. So pre uh, the changes we got in 2014, I provided him with information from the Imperial War Museum about the volumes of film that the Imperial War Museum has in its holdings that without this exception extending to film at that point, ran the risk of being, um, run the risk of eroding and not being um, sustained in the future. And so he made the case very eloquently to the House of Lords about this exception being absolutely fundamental to the long-term sustainability, not just of the heritage sector, but of the collections that we're the custodians of. And I'm so thrilled to see it being part of our copyright legislation now. So any of you who are thinking about your digitization activities, um, creating digital copies of your collection items, this is the one for you. We've got challenges ahead about putting the digital copies online, which we don't have an exception for. So if I can be clear, we do not have a specific exception for putting those digital copies on the web. And that in part, I guess, is um, a casualty of Brexit. We did lose an awful works exception that would have enabled us to do that. Um, but certainly to get us as far as a, having those digital copies of works in our collections and thinking about how we can use other exceptions like the dedicated terminals exception together with this one um, provides us with means to support our digital activities. And just a little word about using more than one exception, totally fine. I refer to this as exception stacking where you use one exception and then another and then another. That's all fine and good, but you need some way of being able to justify your use. Now it could be, you, you could use an exception to copyright to create your um, digital copy for the purposes of preservation. But if you want to use it for another purpose that's not fulfilled by another exception to copyright, then you look to rights clearance. And again, if it is an orphan work, that would be a risk managed approach if you were to choose to go down to that route. So you need a strategy to support how you make those works then available. And I can talk more about that if you have some questions afterwards. Another exception to copyright that got enhanced was access for disabled users. Now, previous to the 2014 changes, um, we had an exception that supported people with visual impairments. This has now been extended to anyone with an accessibility requirement, and that could be both permanent or temporary, and that could be of any shape or form. The um, exception to copyright for providing access for disabled users could be used by film archives creating subtitles on film footage. Now, the kind of bit here to be aware of is that if the accessible version that perhaps a user or visitor needs for um, accessing your collection item is available commercially, that should be the first point of call, i.e. they should buy the commercially available copy. They can't rely on the exception, but if there is no commercially available version to which they need to access that work, and in many cases, there won't be because our items are unique, then this is where this exception kicks in. OK, and you've got an example from here as well about creating tactile versions of items in collections. So that could be 3D versions that people could touch and feel um, in order to better be able to access the items due to specific um, accessibility requirements they may have. Incidental inclusion, we've had this for years. Um, what this means is that if you are um, taking a perhaps a, a picture um, of, a, of um, a gallery space, if there are items in there that might be incidental to the main picture, that can be justifiable. And we've given you an example here from Unsplash of a photograph and you can see the kind of um, a picture of the ballerina in the background that could potentially be used to justify the use of the incidental inclusion exception. And again, we'll be looking at this in more detail as part of our guide to copyright exceptions that will be, will be coming out shortly. And we've given you also some examples of music being played in a gallery space. All of these require attribution. All of these, again, are defences and you need to think about them, I think, both in terms of being reasonable and reasonable use. But I would also say too, there is an aspect here, which is that some of you um, may have commercial activities, commercial arms. There is, I think, a very important point of principle, which is that if we're using exceptions to copyright to their optimum, which is our right to do so, we should also be thinking about what does that mean if we're licensing out content for other people to use? How can we frame it that they too can use our assets in that same way? 
Okay, so I think we need to be aware of double standards and not using exceptions ourselves beyond what we would enable other people to use them for. Okay, so we're nearing the end. One more I want to focus on, which is the freedom of panorama. I love this one. We've had this in our legislative framework forever. Um, unfortunately, not many other countries in the world do, which means that whilst we can take photographs um, of artistic works like sculptures located in public places and use them in the UK, if we were to put those images online, there is risk because the exceptions to copyright that are relevant are the ones in the legislative framework to which users are based. So to make sense of that comment, all, all of you or the most of you I would imagine are based in the UK, you will be subject to UK copyright law and the exceptions to copyright law that I'm outlining here. But if you put something online, you'll have users from all over the world. And therefore, if we put something up on the web, um, we would have to have parity that they would have exactly the same exception to copyright um, as the one that we are using ourselves. And this is why there is a challenge here with regards to perhaps the localized um, use of digital copyright works um, in the UK and the clash between putting these works online. And I can talk about more about this as a question as we move forward. This example here um, is um, a beautiful example of the sculpture of Melissa Forsyth um, by Gillian Waring. Um, we were involved in helping Gillian with the rights clearances in the photographs um, that sit on the plinth. Um, that's located in Trafalgar Square. Please visit it. It's most beautiful. And we are able under this um, exception to copyright to have taken photographs of it and to have shared um, these photographs um, for the purposes of this presentation and using the freedom of panorama exception. So to move forward and to give you sort of some next step places to go. Now there's a lot here, there's a lot of content and I know that and there are other exceptions to copyright but in my mind these are the ones that are most useful for heritage organisations and will not only help you with some of the activities that form part of your digital strategy but as I said at the beginning will also um, release you potentially from costs that enable you to push your digital strategies forward particularly now post Brexit and, and sort of as we come out of Covid. So what do I recommend to you? So first of all reflect on these exceptions. We have them, they're ours, they're hotwired into the legislative framework, they're for us to use. Second of all, think about the context of your uses, okay? Is there a fit between the exception to copyright and also your uses? Might it be that when you're planning your activities, um, planning in as early as possible the potential use of the exception to copyright within a broader copyright strategy? So it's not just about going out and getting permission, but how can you use exceptions to copyright to support what you do? Number three, please be brave, okay? Um, please think about using them more. You will need to set your appetite for risk, but any of you who have heard me speak over the years, I'm a great believer in um, sort of expanding the, the benefits of risk management and also thinking about the sort of appetite for risk that might be appealing to you. Number four, um, think about what's fair. And one of the best ways of doing that is think about how would you feel if you were using someone else's work in that way? And I've touched upon that earlier. And number five, share the word, okay? Because if people don't know that we have them, we won't use them enough. And in my opinion, now it's never been more important to use copyright exceptions to support your digital strategy. So there's more you can find out. Um, we've given you the Intellectual Property Office website. Um, ACE, the Association of Cultural Enterprise has some, some great stuff. Have a look at what we do in our resources page and also please, please keep an eye on the guide um, and that we've both written and also the guide that's going to accompany this presentation. So I wanted to thank you so much for listening. Um, I really hope this helps move you forward and I'd be delighted to take some questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. It was a really insightful session and summarised beautifully as well in the last slide there. Um, I actually had no idea there were so many different elements to think about when thinking about uh, copyright exceptions, but that was very, very, very useful for me, if not for everybody else. Um, we've got loads of questions, as I'm sure you anticipate, and then we've asked the audience to um, upvote them. So we're going to, and always short on time, so we're going to run through them from the top down, if that's all right with you. 
Um, kicking off with Beatrice, she asks, regarding the illustration for instruction exception, can that be used in online webinars that are recorded? Okay, so I think the um, the general view and the general general practice is that the illustration for exception exception does have a potential place to support online webinars, but it depends on what those online webinars look like. If it's to a contained and controlled audience, that then is only made available to that contained and controlled audience, that would I think be within the spirit of what that exception is trying to achieve. If the audience is an open-ended audience, if the webinar is then perhaps hosted on a platform like YouTube, where you have additional terms and conditions regarding making that available, or indeed another similar platform, I think the risk becomes much greater. And if you think about it from the rights holders perspective, because this is also what I'm trying, you to, trying to encourage you to do when you're using the exceptions, they would probably feel that that would encroach upon their ability to financially benefit from copyright and undermine their business models, which, which is exactly what the exceptions are supposed to not do. That balance is very fine indeed. It shouldn't undermine the creative industry. So Beatrice, I think if you can kind of think about the context and, the, and containing the audience, there is a greater likelihood that you can use the illustration for exception, um, exception. Illustration for instruction exception. <laughs> Thank you. It's a bit of a mouthful, that one, isn't it? It was. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Naomi. Next up from Alison. If uh, if a journal image is being used in a publication, that will be sold for profit, but that money is then exclusively used for charitable purposes. Does it still count as a for-profit activity? It's a great question. Um, I think that... Um... There is debate about this, and I think that there's there's a, there's there's a there's a debate about whether this would be justifiable or not. Okay, because again, um, a rights holder would expect that you would use um, a license in order to legitimately include an art um, an image in a journal. So I think that there would be a challenge. I think that there would also be um, issues as well if that publication were then open access. And I know that um, within the say university sector for students who are writing dissertations, they're encouraged by the university to seek permission to include images or to get pre-licensed images in their dissertations because those, those dissertations, whether they're masters or PhD dissertations are then made available under a Creative Commons license that would sort of undermine the rights holders because anyone could then reuse those images. So I think that there are, the, the context is important here. So. I would I would put a question mark on that. Sounds like it's always best to err on the side of caution when <laughs> when there's a commercial when there's when you make something available globally, and when there's a sort of even an inferred commercial benefit, that the sort of likelihood of the exceptions to copyright diminishes. I suppose is the best way to put it. The more something is sort of made available to a contained audience to fully support the types of activities that I, I've outlined in today's presentation the greater the likelihood the exceptions will come into play. Brilliant, thanks, Naomi. Um, next and uh, possibly last question from me, if I hope I've said uh, your name correctly there. Um, apologies if not. Um, would using illustrations for educational purposes cover a series of educational blog posts or social media posts? Um, I would say no, because that's not to a contained audience. Okay, a blog will normally be accessible to everybody. And similarly, social media posts, um, those are meant for a global audience. And when you use a social media platform, you are not only um, needing to make sure you sort out the copyright because of the global audience, but you become subject to the terms and conditions of that social media platform. That means that effectively you're relicensing the content you're posting to the social media platform and to really anyone else that they want that social media platform has a relationship with. Now you can download from our website a further fact sheet about this if that's helpful. But I would say that that would be harder to justify that particular use. Brilliant. Well, we are out of time. Thank you very much, Naomi.